Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Studman Brother Don. I'm Brother Don, and it's good to be here with you this evening to study God's Word and, and to learn His truth. And I just want to say thank you to all of the subscribers and to some of the new subscribers and to all the thumbs up that we've been getting, and that just helps get it out a little bit more. And uh, also all the comments. And I've gotten several comments and questions uh, the last uh, week or so. And so tonight, before we start the, our study in Zechariah, I'm going to answer a couple of questions. And then we will try to finish up Zechariah, depending on how long I take answering these questions. So, but I appreciate the questions, the emails, and um, I just, just thank you for that. So uh, let's pray, and then we will uh, get into these questions and then into our, our study. Father, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for your word that by your Holy Spirit, you lead us and guide us into all truth. And Father, you teach us your way. Lord, we ask for that tonight, that you would just be with us and teach us. And Father, give us hearts that we can hear and understand. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. First of all, a gentleman wants to know that people who take the mark of the beast during the tribulation and then they live through the tribulation, in other words, they're alive at the end of the tribulation, will they be allowed to enter the millennial? And uh, I talked about this a little bit last night in my teaching on Micah, and so the question very possibly came from that, or maybe even a couple of weeks ago when we talked a little bit about that. And uh, the short answer is no, they they will not if they have taken the mark of the beast during the time of the tribulation and they happen to live until the end, they will not. Uh, first of all, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 25, you have the, uh, I should have gone there first, you have the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And that is right after the second coming of Jesus Christ. So right at the end of the tribulation and in this judgment, beginning in verse 31, I'm not going to read this. It, it, it's 31 through 46. But in this judgment, the thing that they're going to be judged on is how they treated Israel, God's people during the seven year tribulation period. And those that that didn't treat them according to God's word, in other words, with kindness, with love, with help, uh, they will uh, be condemned. And he will tell them in verse 41, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I can't, I can't see just, um, you know, just, just thinking about things from a, just a general, let's say logical viewpoint that people that would take the mark of the beast, and we're going to look at this in Revelation 13, that if they would take the mark of the beast, then they would turn around and be kind to Israel or Christians, people that are going to get saved during the tribulation period. Because in taking the mark of the beast, according to Revelation 13, they have to worship the beast and believe the lie. And we're going to see that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So in verse 14, talking about the false prophet of Revelation chapter 13, it says it deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it is permitted to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was permitted to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And it makes everyone small, great, rich, and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead. And we know from other studies, from reading other scriptures, that when you take the mark of the beast, that, that is condemnation you're done. You, there's no turning back. There's no second chance. And so those who would bow to and worship the Antichrist, the beast, and would worship him to the point that they would take his mark, they're not going to look well upon God's people, be it the Jews or, or people that get saved, uh, tribulation saints. And so when it comes down then to Matthew 25, 
the judgment of the sheep and the goat before we enter the the uh, millennial kingdom, they're going to be uh, condemned to hell. So no, they will not be going. And he said in here, you know, that it, he causes them to believe or to worship the beast. And he deceives them on earth because of the signs. So go back to Second Thessalonians real quick and look at chapter two, because there's an interesting thing, the way that, that things are worded in scripture. And that's why I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, because even down to the words, the way that he words things through different people in different times. So in verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie. So here we have the signs and wonders, just like Revelation 13 talked about. And he says, these wonders serve the lie. So what is the lie? Well, the lie, I think, is what he said in Revelation 13, caused them to worship the beast. And we're going to see that here in Second Thessalonians. And he says, uh, verse 10, with every wicked deception among those who are perishing, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie and verse 12, so that they all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. So if they receive the mark of the beast, if they worship the beast, which they will because they refused the truth, they refused the grace of God. So God gives them up, gives them over delusion, it says, gives them over to a depraved mind so that they will believe the lie. What is the lie? Again, Revelation 13, uh, he worshiped the beast. But notice what he says in verse 4 here of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, Paul calls him here. In verse 4, it says, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship, and he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Now, to me, that's the lie. And if you'll go back all the way to the beginning, back in Genesis, the reason that Lucifer, Satan, the old dragon, was kicked out of heaven, sin was found in him, is because Isaiah 14, he said, I will be like God. And then when he was kicked out and he was in the garden, the thing that he used to deceive Eve was, you can be like God. And to me, that's been the lie since day one, that that is the lie. And that's what deceives people today. And when you think about the main problems that we have in our world today, the, the biggest ungodliness that we have in our world today, all of it at its root goes back to man saying, I'll be God. I'll decide. I'll fix these things. Uh, isn't that what abortion is? Deciding who will live and who will die? I'll be God. Transgender. The way I was born, the way I was created is not right, so I will change it. All of these nations coming together, the United Nations, and trying to work out peace and trying to decide how to fix the world's problems, the World Economic Forum, BRICS. Nobody is repenting and turning to God. Nobody is saying, God, we can't fix this. You fix it. What are they saying? will fix it. And isn't that saying, I'm God? So that's been the lie since the beginning. And at the midpoint of the tribulation, when Antichrist enters the temple in Jerusalem and sets himself up as God, the lie is that he is God. They will believe him and they will receive the mark of the beast. And when they do that, we read it right here, 
2 Thessalonians 2, beginning in 10, with every wicked deception among those who are perishing, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie so that all will be condemned. So no, they will not enter the, um, the millennial reign at the end of the tribulation. If they live through the tribulation, they will be condemned. And as Matthew 25 tells us, then they'll be cast into the lake of fire, cast into hell. Um, the next question kind of ties into what we've been saying here. And I don't remember who, uh, I think it was a lady that asked, can the temple be rebuilt before the rapture? Which see, you see how that kind of ties into what we've been talking about. And, uh, the, the short answer to that is, is yes. It, I mean, it, it can be done whenever God wants it done. The long answer is, is I don't think so. So, so yes, it, it can be built whenever. I mean, it, it's, it's up to God. God can, can work a miracle right now in the Middle East. And the problem with the temple being built is the temple mount. And the problem with the temple mount is Israel does not control it. The Muslims do. And actually, Jordan, the nation of Jordan, through some treaties and some workings years ago, the nation Jordan actually controls the Temple Mount. And the only reason that the Jews are allowed to go to the Wailing Wall, to that Western Wall, and, and to pray and to worship is because Jordan lets them. And they let them just to, to attempt to keep peace. So right now, the Jews have no right to the Temple Mount. That's why the, the uh, temple has not been rebuilt yet. When will it be rebuilt? Well, I, I have a timeline in my head of when I think it's all going to play out. When you read passages like Daniel 9.27, the, the Antichrist, the prince that is to come, he's going to make a covenant with Israel. And, well, let's just turn back there real quick. Daniel 9.27, and oh, I'm, I'm way past it. And he says, uh, speaking of the one that is to come, he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And the abomination of desolation will be on the wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. So for all of that to happen, the firm covenant and then in the middle of the week for him to put a stop to sacrifice to offering and then the abomination of desolation on the wing of the temple, there has to be a temple. And if you believe like I do, I believe that verse 27 is future. I believe verse 27 is, is the, the 70th week of, of Daniel's 70 weeks. 69 have been fulfilled. Uh, they were fulfilled and ended with Christ's death on the cross. There was a pause, the church age, the age of grace that we live in, and then the 70th week, which has to do with verse 24, Daniel's people and his holy city. And that's what's going to happen during the 70th week. There has to be a temple for this to happen. So at some point through all of that, the where we are right now, the rapture, all of the things that are set to play out in prophecy there will be a temple that will be rebuilt. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus says, as he's given uh, the disciples the, the overview of the, the coming uh, end days and tribulation period, he says, and when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it shouldn't be in the temple, as Daniel the prophet said, he said, then let those who are in Jerusalem flee, and you know the passage. So again, for all of that to come to pass, there has to be a temple. So when will it be rebuilt? I believe that it will be rebuilt, and this is me, after the rapture of the church and after the revealing of the Antichrist. I believe there are certain things that have to happen to put this in place. And again, this goes back to what I was saying and talking about, that Israel does not have control of the Temple Mount. 
So something has to happen that allows Israel, if not to have control of the Temple Mount, at least to have access, free access to it, not like what they have now. And I believe that what that event is, is the Ezekiel 38 war. And I believe during that war, which if you go back and read in Ezekiel 38, all of the nations that are going to uh, attack Israel and Iran is one of the prime ones. And Iran is one of the, the main forces behind Islam and behind the hatred of Israel right now. And so Iran, in okay, verse 5, Ezekiel 38, Persia, Cush put with them of the shields and helmets, uh, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Togomar, and then many from the parts of the north, Russia. So all of these Muslim nations combined with Russia are going to come against Israel. And so when Israel wins this war, which they will through the strength and intervention of God, they will win this war. The, the strength of the Muslim nations is going to be broken. Now, there's still going to be Muslim nations because there's going to be Muslim nations that don't take part in this war. And some of them, even in verse 13, they're, they're mentioned there. There are going to be Muslim nations still in existence, but their strength, their military might is going to be broken in this war. And I also believe that this war, Ezekiel 38, is what is going to give the Antichrist his platform to come on the world and bring peace. You read some of the other passages, passages in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 11, and you see and understand that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be a... a well, he's going to be a miracle worker. Uh, we read there in Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians 2 that, that the false prophet's going to be able to work signs and wonders in the presence of the Antichrist. So Satan's going to work through him and he's going to be able to do things. And he's going to, be a, 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 he's going to bring, uh, fix a lot of the world's problems militarily. We see that in 927, the covenant that he's going to make, which will bring peace to the Middle East. He's going to fix economic problems, and that's even going to play into Revelation 13. You can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. All of those things that he's going to do. So this war, Ezekiel 38, I believe is what's going to give him the platform to step up and take over. And he's going to work out a covenant, probably between Israel and and those surrounding Muslim nations that, that are left. And part of that covenant, I believe, is going to be that they can build the temple, rebuild the temple. So my timeline would be from where we are right now, rapture, antichrist revealed, or if not revealed, at least he's moving in political circles, Ezekiel 38, Antichrist come to power, make a covenant with Israel, Israel rebuild the temple. And then at the three and a half year point into the tribulation is when the abomination, <clears throat> abomination of desolation happens. So that's the way that I see it playing out. The temple has to be rebuilt and it has to be in operation for the abomination of desolation to happen. And that's in the book of Daniel, that's in, in the Gospels and Second Thessalonians and in the book of Revelation. They all talk about that event. And for that to happen, the temple has to be rebuilt and it has to be an operation that is um, offering sacrifices, the high priest. And so you think, well, can they do that? Well, from everything that I've seen and everything that I've read and heard, yes, they can do it. Every, they, they, everything that they need to put the temple in operation, including the temple itself, from what I've read and, and what I've heard, they have. 
it, it's, it's ready. They've got everything they need. All they need is the temple mount. And I just laid you out the scenario that I think is going to bring them the temple mount. And everything that I've read and heard, they can have it up in a matter of weeks. So let's just say everything played out and, and uh, let's by January of 2025, Ezekiel 38, all of that's raptures happen. Ezekiel 38's happened. Antichrist on the scene. He makes a deal with Israel, a covenant. They, they could probably be in full swing with the, with the temple by February or March. That's, that's what I hear. They have even got a replica of the ark already made. It, it's, it's made and ready to go into the Holy of Holies so they can once again on the Day of Atonement, offer the sacrifice to God. So that's what, how, what I think about the temple and when it will be rebuilt and how all that's going to play out. Uh, some of this I talked about a little bit last night in my study in Micah on, on the Wednesday night Bible study there at Spring Hill. And um, a lot of people get upset about that. Well, man, they, they can't start offering sacrifices. Jesus was the sacrifice for our sins, and, and he put and end to the sacrificial system. And, and yes, that's true, but not to the Jews. They don't believe that. They haven't received Jesus. So they don't accept his death on the cross as the atonement for their sin. And so the first chance they get, they're going to start offering sacrifices again because they are still under the law. And the new covenant, as we've looked at several times, even in this study in Zechariah, the new covenant won't come into play for them until the end of the tribulation when Jesus Christ returns. And um, we uh, that's what we were going to look at tonight. We looked at the second coming last week. And uh, in particular there in, in uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, look, a day belonging to the Lord is coming when the plunder taken from you will be divided in your presence. And I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured, the houses looted, and the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. So when, when Antichrist and, and all the nations come against Israel for a period of time, as I, I said last week, it's going to look like that Israel is going to be destroyed. And you see that all the way through the tribulation. If you go back again and read in Daniel and some of those passages back there, uh, the when the little horn rose up, he was given authority. Daniel seven twenty one. as I was watching, this horn waged war against the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the Ancient of Days arrived and was given in favor of, and judgment was given in favor of the Holy Ones. So there's going to be a time period that, that he is going to, it looks like, destroy Israel and Jerusalem. But, verse 3, then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. Verse four, on that day, his feet, I could read this. I, I read it last week and I read it the week, but I could read this every day. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's when he defeats Israel's enemies. He's gonna go to battle against them and and it, it, it's just gonna be awesome. We'll be with him. We will, we will have come back with him when this happens and, and we'll witness the destruction of of antichrist and and those that that follow him we'll, we'll see all of that and at that time then chapter 12 in verse 10 then well verse 9 they go together on that day i the lord jesus will set out to destroy all the nations that come against jerusalem then i will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of david and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him. That's when the new covenant starts for Israel. 
that's when they realized that, yes, this Jesus that we now see standing before us, this Jesus that now is going forward to fight our battles for us, was truly our Messiah. And he was truly the one that came and gave himself for our sins. That's when they will recognize that. So, okay, I'm not gonna uh, go any further. We'll, we'll just pick up and finish out Zechariah beginning in verse nine and going through verse 21 next week because it's 25 minutes already. Thank you for your questions. And if you have any more questions, leave them in the comments, uh, YouTube or Facebook. And if you don't want to make them, leave them like that, then email me and I'll leave my email address down below in the description of this video. And you can email me and uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And uh, I may even use it like this, your question to uh, uh, do a little teaching on it like that. So, so thank you for being with me tonight. And I just ask you to keep praying for each other because a lot of things has happened and a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, Trump won the presidential election and he's already picking his cabinet. And most of the people that he is picking are going to be what I call Israel friendly. They're going to support Israel. And so I think we're going to see some major changes in the Middle East and in what's going on over there right now. And uh, I, I think maybe some of those, Iran maybe, and some of the others, they may kind of back down. But then again, it could be just the opposite. And it could cause Russia, Turkey, Iran, the other nations, it could cause them to get up and say, hey, here we come. So we'll just have to watch and see. God bless you and thank you for being with me. I'll see you next week.